Um, often forgotten uh, when we talk about floodplains uh, such as Barman Mill or Forest that they are linked, that the floodplain is linked to the river and it's flooding which actually drives that connectivity and connectivity enables a two-way uh, exchange of material it allows biota such as fish to move onto the floodplain to feed, possibly spawn, to move back out it brings food back out into the river channel for other organisms to uh, feed on and allows the exchange of other organic materials, carbon and nutrients. In the past uh, 10 years or so, I guess during the so-called millennium drought, uh, connectivity uh, was very much a one-way street. We managed our wetlands for some very targeted ecological benefits such as the health of river red gum forests. Little consideration was given uh, to returning water back to the main river channel and to what benefits the river channel or the biota within the river channel could derive from that returning floodwaters. This is mainly because there were concerns over poor water quality, there were issues during the, uh, during the drought years <coughs> where water returning to rivers, uh, we had the so-called hypoxic blackwater events which uh, resulted in uh, substantial numbers of fish deaths, uh, crayfish uh, becoming terrestrial um, and other adverse impacts. So in June, July 2010, uh, I think it was the Murray-Darling Basin Authority uh, decided they were going to put a winter uh, flood through Barma Forest. Uh, it had two aims. Uh, the first aim was to actually inundate parts of the floodplain obviously. The second one was to allow some of that flood water to return to the river. And that's where we came in. Uh, this is just a very uh, dirty view of Barmer Forest from my world. Uh, up the top, whoop, pointer here. Um, uh, Murray comes in at Token Wall. It's got a capacity of about 30,000 megalitres a day, after which it exceeds it will go out in the floodplain. Comes in the forest, uh, about eight and a half thousand megalitres a day can go out through the choke and a further uh, two and a half thousand megalitres can go out through the Edwards River. Given the capacity of Barmer Forest of about 11,000 uh, megalitres a day of water. So the environmental flow came down and in typical management fashion uh, someone in Canberra decided they're going to put the environmental flow down. Uh, they start the flow and then rang us up and said can you go out and monitor it. Um, that's the environmental flow there. I can't remember what the exact figures for the amount of water that was supposed to go onto the floodplain, uh, but somewhere along the line, some of the water got lost. The green line here is uh, the 11,000 megalitres a day which it takes to uh, uh, overbank into the forest. So we can see our um, environmental flow just managed to do that, so we actually did get some water out onto the floodplain. Uh, so we went out and we measured a uh, a range of what we called, or we, what we thought were key um, bits. Um, we did dissolved organic carbon, which looks a bit like briquettes here. Um, <laughs> that, that are chunky bits of carbon. We sampled uh, zooplankton, these are rotifers and microcrustaceans. Uh, we did algae in the form of chlorophyll, and we also did uh, total nitrogen and total uh, phosphorus. And we did, we took some very small numbers and we converted them to biomass and converted that to metric tonnes of each component uh, moving in the water column at Topham Wall uh, in the Edwards River and below Barmer Forest. We then um, calculated what was coming into the forest, uh, which was at Topham Wall, 
and we took that away from what was actually flowing out of the forest, which was the sum of uh, what was at Barmer Forest and what was at Four Post. Um, and that gave us an estimate of what was uh, being exported or being contributed to the water column uh, from the actual Barmer Forest. We also uh, did some stable isotopes on biofilms. Uh, biofilm is a complex mixture of algae, bacteria, fungi, dendritis, and general crap. Um, it's actually a very important food resource. Uh, things like chromids and, and shrimp uh, graze on this, uh, uh, this matrix, um, so they'll incorporate whatever type of food is in the biofilm into their own body, you are what you eat, um, and that would then flow up into uh, other more charismatic organisms such as uh, fish. Um, just a bit on stable isotopes. In general, uh, if your uh, is carbon isotope sig signature is greater than minus 29, it means that you're getting your carbon from in-stream sources, uh, primarily algae. If it's less than minus 29, then your carbon is derived from more terrestrial sources, um, such as uh, leaflet or dissolved carbon coming from uh, river red gums. So this is what we found. This is our environmental flow. Uh, remembering that's our little little peak coming down there. So in general, what we see here is that uh, there's oh, and what this shows is uh, anything above this red line is being exported from the forest. Anything uh, below the red line is actually what uh, is being retained in the forest. So what we're seeing is that in general, nitrogen and forest phosphorus phosphorus is being retained in the forest. There's, there's more going in than what's actually coming out. Uh, slightly different story with our, uh, our chunk of dissolved carbon, our uh, algae and our zooplankton, in that it's pretty much in, in balance. What's going in is what's going out. So there's nothing being lost to the floodplain or lost within the channel, and there's nothing being gained uh, from the floodplain itself. Uh, slightly different story when we looked at our stable isotopes. Uh, we can see that um, uh, at Topamore and in Barma, it's very much an, an algal-derived uh, food source. Um, slightly different here at, uh, in the Edwards River where we had a, a depletion which indicates that the flows here were leaking some water back out into the Edwards River, um, which was carrying dissolved organic carbon, which was being incorporated into the uh, biofuel matrix. So there was some contributions uh, to from, of terrestrial carbon into the food web. And to be honest, that's where the story should have ended, because uh, that's what we were, we were paid to do. Um, fortunately, Mother Nature came to the party and uh, <laughs> invested uh, more water into environmental flows um, than what the government was prepared to do. Um, <laughs> so this is our environmental flow here. We've got roughly about 100,000 megalitres a day put in by Mother Nature. This is the MDA contribution down there, so we've got about a tenfold increase in, in water coming through. Uh, so we went out and we ran exactly the same sampling regime as we had done uh, previously. Uh, we went and looked at our phosphorus and nitrogen, and nitrogen, and as you can see, at the peak of the flood, we're getting substantial contributions of nutrients back into the river channel. Roughly about 15 tonne per day at the peak of the flood of nitrogen, and about two and a half tonne at the peak of the flood of phosphorus. So substantial inputs of uh, nutrients back into the river. Similarly for carbon, our carbon sources, uh, dissolved organic carbon, roughly about 250 tonne per day at the peak of the flood being returned back in the river. That's an immense amount of fuel for the system. There was about seven tonne of zooplankton, small rotifers and microcrustaceans uh, coming back into the river and roughly about half a tonne of algae. Now these sort these sources here are being derived probably uh, through the contribution of the early flood going out in the floodplain, wetting the wetlands, stimulating productivity. So these things are starting to develop already. When the second flood has come through, that they've already been there. They've been washed back up out onto the river. And the carbon here is obviously coming from the stores of leaf litter that were already on the floodplain. And we can see that's reflected in our stable isotope uh, signature that both that uh, Barmer and in the Edwards River, um, substantial depletion of our stable isotope signature in our biofilm, which indicates that biofilm switched from an algal dominated source of carbon to a much more terrestrial source of carbon. 
we see a, a bit of a depletion here at Tokenville, a bus stream, and we think that's because the flood has exceeded the 30,000 megalitres a day. It's actually gone out in the flood plain above the Barmer Forum and has then started washing uh, carbon back in as well. So the environmental flow, it was sufficient to inundate portions of the flood plain. It did actually achieve that objective. But it didn't contribute any carbon or nutrients back into the river. And the in-stream food web remained fuelled by uh, <coughs> algae-derived uh, carbon. Mother Nature's flow, which was substantially more significant, did inundate significant areas of floodplain and it contributed significant amounts of carbon and nutrients back in the river. More than 280 tonnes per day at the peak of the flood was flowing back off the forest into the River Murray. And about 15 tonnes, or more than 15 tonnes a day of nutrients were being contributed back into the river. And the food web switched from an outward dominated food web to a terrestrial dominated food web. The interactions between flow primary production and circular production, they are complex and they're very difficult to tease out. <coughs> but in this case, and we're not going to try and tease it out, but we can say that in low flow, uh, the Murray River probably has a very low nutrient status, it's, it will have low metabolic activity and it will have low productivity. Under flood conditions, or following a flood, it's going to have a much higher nutrient status, it's going to be more metabolically active and it's going to be a more productive system. So inundation of the floodplain served two purposes in this case. It fueled both the autotrophic food web by increasing the amount of primary production on the floodplain and increasing the amount of secondary, secondary production on the floodplain, uh, which all contributes to the in-stream food web uh, because it will be incorporated through uh, grazing, predation and general decay. It also contributed substantially to the heterotrophic food web where tr substantial amounts of terrestrial carbon was incorporated back into the biofilm matrix, particularly the fungal and bacterial components. And this will also be incorporated back into the river-run food web through biograzing. <coughs> so in conclusion, flooding in this case did provide a pulse of nutritionally high quality carbon. And that high quality carbon will be incorporated in food webs. We need to maintain that pulsing of floods through the floodplain to actually keep that high quality, that short-term boost to the system. Thank you.